I'll tell you a little bit more about her. Her award-winning journalism has appeared in the New York Times, as well as in The Guardian, in Elle, and in Toronto Life. She is a former film critic, so she wrote written criticism on films, and she also was on a television show called Real to Real for a few years, and please ask her more about that. She is, um, was writing for the National Post as a film critic, and she is currently a arts and living columnist for the Globe and Mail, formerly the style columnist for the Globe. Her first novel, How Happy to Be, was published in Canada by McClellan and Stewart in 2006, and her nonfiction has been anthologized in, in many, many textbooks for students, but also in books like Between Interruptions and Because I Love Her, which is, uh, I think it's published by Harlequin, is that right? Yeah, weird, that is weird. The most recent novel, or her most recent novel, is Everybody Has Everything, which was long listed for the Giller Prize. That's quite an honor. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, the book has not only been published in Canada, but in other places around the world. She lives in Toronto, and she's married with children, but I'm sure she'll tell you a little bit more about her life. So please join me in welcoming Katrina Onstad. So thank you very much for having me, uh, Fanshawe College and Ingrid, for uh, putting this together. It's really nice to be here. Um, and thank you for coming. I know everybody is busy. I hope there are a few people who are here, not because they're forced to be here for credit. Those are my favorite kind of people. They really just came of their own volition, but I accept the credit seekers as well. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I write, as Ingrid said, both fiction and non-fiction. Um, and I guess my subject is modern life, really, often urban life and how we live now. Uh, in my journalism, I'm often looking at uh, sociology and the politics of popular culture. Um, but I live this strange life where I'm attacking these questions sort of head on in my nonfiction work as a columnist in the Globe and the magazines that I write for. Um, uh, but in my fictional life, I get to come at the contemporary world from a sort of spiritual side, an aesthetic side, um, looking at things in the abstract and through what I hope is a poetic eye. Uh, sometimes I feel really lucky to have these two sides, um, which kind of feed into each other, but other times it feels really unsatisfying and sort of schizophrenic. Um, I ultimately like to just do the fiction, but I cannot figure out a way to make money off of that yet. Um, but maybe you guys will buy all these books and then it will all start happening. So um, I'm going to do just a couple of readings from my two novels and talk a little bit about what they are as I'm doing it. But I'm, I'm really hoping that um, you'll ask me questions. I really like that. I really like, like a conversation about writing. Um, and if anybody in here is hoping to make a living as a writer, I might know a little bit about that. And I'll try not to be too disheartening about the profession. <laughs> um, but I, I do really like talking about it. So please ask questions, and also I'll be around after if you want to come up and if you're feeling shy and want to talk privately, I'm here. So knowing that this audience might be a little bit younger, I am going to read, just, I haven't read from this in a while, um, and I'm getting a little bit sick of reading from this one, <laughs> the new one. So I thought I'd do a little throwback because I thought this might interest you guys. Um, this was my debut novel, How Happy to Be. Um, and this passage that I'm going to read also has a celebrity cameo, so if there's anybody studying film who might be interested in this. Um, this book came out in 2006, and it's, uh, it was a bit of a satire of celebrity culture, as well as kind of a belated coming-of-age story. Uh, it's set before 9-11 in a Toronto uh, that now is almost unrecognizable. It's kind of pre-wired. I was looking at this passage last night, and there's a reference called Palm Pilot in it, which gives you a sense of how fast things have moved. Um, this technology actually plays a significant part in this novel, um, and it could not keep up with it. It takes so long to write a book uh, that the technology kept changing, and it, kept, it was very difficult to keep the characters current, um, which I thought was kind of interesting. So the heroine of this book is Max. She's an entertainment journalist in her early 30s, um, but she lives like she's about 10 years younger. Uh, she's kind of a party girl hiding out in the pop culture noise of her time, uh, avoiding the reality of her life. And the reality of her life is quite sad, actually. She's um, just gone through a very painful breakup, 
and her mother died a long time ago, she was raised on a commune, and she's never really dealt with her past. And really, uh, the book is sort of a meditation on grief and about her coming to terms with her unacknowledged grief. Um, so she's having sort of a personal and professional crisis when she's flown to Los Angeles in this passage to do a junket. Does anybody know what a junket is? A press junket? Anybody? Yeah? Lots of interviews set up every 15, 30 minutes. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's it. I mean, but usually what happens is film companies will fly journalists um, around the world to nice locations, put them up in nice hotels, and fly them with alcohol and good food, and then put them in a room very quickly with very high profile celebrities for about 10, 15 minutes, and it's like a kind of turnstile of interviewing. And this is kind of how your uh, celebrity uh, entertainment journalism sausage is made. It's actually a pretty unpleasant process for everybody. Um, and so Max is uh, here in Los Angeles, and uh, she's kind of had it with this part of her life and her profession. Um, and you'll see that she's having a little bit of a crisis of conscience. So we'll start with this. There are eight of us around the table, adjusting our tape recorders, quietly test, test, testing, although at this particular table there's a lot of homme de trois and Einspiel dry, map-sized plastic tags dangle around our necks in case we get lost and need to be returned to our home countries, Belgium, Japan, Spain, we're otherwise known as Team A. I've been placed at the foreign journalist's table by some publicist who finds Canada exotic. It's flattering in a way. Dinner last night was crap, says Australia, a man who doesn't trust the name tag to convey fully his nationality and has topped off his cliché with a floppy crocodile dundee hat. Last year we went to that steak place and this year it's some Tex-Mex crap. Japan nods, it's more cheap this year, she says. Japan pulls out a Palm Pilot. From Eddie Murphy junket, the table moans with envy. Sure, we're bumped out in $400 a night hotel rooms with spine-conforming pillows and baskets of foot softener. But where's the free technological equipment? This movie sucks. So team A, I say, do you guys think we should get a mascot or a cheer or something? How about like a viper or a manatee? Team A ignores me. A publicist scurries to the table, a single bead of sweat miraculously balanced on his brow, jutting out like a pea. The producers will be first, followed by the writer, then Miss Aniston, he says. Anyone need anything? Espresso? Chai latte? Damn straight, everyone needs something, and when the snacks arrive, the table devours and conquers. Here's the thing. Most entertainment writers earn very little money and even less prestige. These men and women who have been flown here from all around the world live most likely in one-room haciendas, grimy ground floor apartments with moldy bathtub grouting, their desk drawers stuffed with thumbed copies of Hello! magazine, and half-completed movie scripts of their own. Something in them wanted this, though, proximity, if nothing else. The sadder ones are those who truly loved the movies once. They thought they could make a living, best job in the world, writing about movies, and that writing about movies was a way to write about love and dying and laughing. But slowly they were pushed toward celebrity profiles and diets and dating stories, and these ones have kids to support, alimony to pay. At the next table there are two, the stooping Spanish man and the shriveled British woman, identifiable by the novels in their laps. So they know what it means to write about celebrity for a living, the wearing down, the dulling, but they do it anyway. Those, I admit, are my favorites, the broken back ones. The producers ushered in an oily creature in squeaky lo loafers that warn of his approach. Italy launches the first question, do you love the movie? Why yes, the producer loves the movie. Everyone worked together, 110%, it was like a family. Familia, he says, for the benefit of Italy. And this project mattered because no other movie like it has ever been made before. I know nobody on my, my movie is a diva. I don't turn on my tape recorder or take notes or ask questions, and eventually no one else does either. This is too much of a PR crapathon, even for Team A. We sit in silence, staring at the producer's hands, wondering about all those gold rings keeping his fingers from touching. Looking uncomfortable, he signals the publicist and is removed. The publicist returns cross. Listen. You're expected to ask questions. We do keep a list of who's participating, he says. This means we might not be invited back. The same way people who write one too many negative pieces, the actor can never appear too stoned, too fat, too stupid, are invited back. In the same way no one on a junket writes negative pieces because the editors need the movie companies to advertise. And just thinking about all these unspoken rules, it's too much 
like the compound, too much unsaid, and I feel it all of a sudden, language, thick and liquid, curling around us, prying at our mouths and pens, trying to get out, and us, too cowardly to use it. The screenwriter has a patina of mourning over his skin, eyes encrusted with sleep. According to the press notes, the writer went to Harvard. He answers questions in three languages, one of which is Japanese, so let's give him bonus points and call it three and a half. Looking from face to face intently, he describes a film like this. I think that slowly all of us are shying away from intimacy. We're shying away using clever, cynical devices. If you look at films, any truly emotional moment is undercut by a cynical moment right afterwards, he says. I think the way we lead our lives, all of us is prone to unhappiness because we're taught to want things. We're taught to think we're not complete without something. And unhappiness, like a background drone, pushes us not to feel because what we feel is unhappiness. Australia yawns, adjusts his hat. The Estonian journal gets up and scampers to the buffet for a muffin. This is my job. Work used to mean digging and building in days dictated by sun and snow. This is some new kind of work. A steady magnetic hum of tape recorders clicking and the electroshock of computer screens. The publicist is the one organic component, huffing and puffing, circling the table, kicking at the carpet with his heels, scribbling the names of non-participants on his clipboard, consulting the stopwatch attached to his wrist. By jolting the audience into strong emotion, you can make them feel. By feeling the unhappiness, we reclaim our humanity with all the imperfections that make us human, says the screenwriter. I hear myself speaking before any editing instinct takes over. No offense, but this is a romantic comedy starring Jennifer Aniston about a Manhattan career woman who inherits twin babies when her maid, Amelda, is deported. Do you really think it's a film about emotional intimacy? The publicist leans close to my name tag and scribbles hard on the clipboard. <laughs> the writer nods, turns even paler. He should have seen the first draft, he mutters. The panic has turned to pain, lodged itself between my eyebrows. I rub my forehead. The writer's removed, and Jennifer Aniston approaches, tan collarbone sharp enough to slice cheese. Mm -hmm. She sits, adjusts her tank top, shakes her hair that hangs like medieval chainmail over her face. Two bottles of water, one sparkling, one flat, and two glasses appear in front of her. The screenwriter, it occurs to me, was not offered water. Several journalists laugh loudly for no reason. Tape recorders slide toward her. Aniston's hands rise slowly to her face, and she parts her hair, looks out at us with a small, tired smile. Hi, she says quietly. A starting gun. The questions fly. Do you like the Brad Pitt? Asks Italy. Will you make it a baby? That screenwriter is wrong. Unhappiness isn't a jolt. It's a dull, ignored ache. You can go years without acknowledging it, decades even, but it does find you. One day, finally, it just marches up and demands your attention, a feral child slapping at its captors. This pounding above my eyes, then, I think it's grief, and grief demands to be taken seriously. Grief demands air to breathe, and nothing can breathe here. So there she is on the edge of a major nervous breakdown. <laughs> um, and I did a little bit of that junketing. People always ask me if this book is autobiographical, and it's really not. This woman is insane. Um, or insane in a different way than I be. Um, but the one thing that I was drawing upon from my life was my experience um, covering uh, celebrities, um, which I, the whole time that I was doing that, I felt like it was so right for satire. And it's such an absurd thing to do with one's life, and fun, and nuts. So if anyone wants to talk about that, I'm happy to answer questions about junk and that kind of thing, too. OK. So there's your little beginning. Now this is the book that I've been talking a lot about lately. This one. Um, and it's kind of different. This was a different experience for me. I wrote this one mostly before I had kids, at a very different point in my life and I had a very different idea of what I wanted to say and why I even wanted to speak in the first place. And it was very cultural and very um, very political in, in its own way. I think satire always is political. Uh, and this one is much more intimate and it's um, very much about parenting and mortality. So um, I was asked, I've been asked a lot to sum it up in one sentence, which is a really mean thing to ask of a writer. <laughs> Um, so my sentence is like, it goes like this. I say, it's about a childless couple that inherits a child after an accident. Um, but I'm incapable of doing it in one sentence, so then I go, 
as they wait to see if their child's mother will wake up from a coma, the cracks in their marriage and their tidy urban existence become a crevasse, and then the person goes, yeah, okay, I got it. And I go, but wait, there's more. It's also about maternal ambivalence and materialism, and it's funny in parts. But by then, people are usually gone. They don't really want to hear anymore. <laughs> so I started writing this book after I had my second kid when she was about a year old, and she's seven now, so that gives you a sense. It came out in May. I've had the glacial pace of writing. Like, I'm not good at this. It takes me forever, and I have to cram it in around my working life. Um, it's like slow motion to write and to parent. Um, but it proved a fruitful time to be writing with these two little kids because what I learned at home with them was that as soon as you have children, you are consumed with thoughts of death. This is the this is antithetical to what you think is going to happen. Um, but I believe when you have young children, suddenly you see death everywhere, right? It's as if the kind of great life force that's entered your world uh, conjures up its exact opposite or its absence. And it's really terrifying to have children. I, the book is a little bit of a horror story for me. Um, no one tells you how scary it is. <laughs> so as a writer, I was really interested in that terror, but I didn't really know what to do with it. Um, and then I thought, well, if these incredibly vulnerable, helpless creatures don't die immediately because I'm going to drop them on their heads or they're going to be stolen by bears or whatever thing is definitely going to happen, um, then surely I'm the one who's going to die, right? This is how my postnatal mind was working, <laughs> working when I came up with this, because the universe could just couldn't be so generous as to give me these wonderful children and let it happen, let us live together in peace, right? Um, also, I think I'm that pessimistic even when I don't have little children, but <laughs> in this imagined sort of macabre scenario when I died, also my husband was going to go with me because it's an equal marriage, I think. <laughs> I just imagine we would both be wiped off the face of the earth and what would happen to our children? And this is another question that you always ask yourself when you have kids. What would happen if we weren't here? Um, and what it meant, of course, is that our kids would be orphans. And orphans, you know, that's, uh, that's great storytelling, right? That's you get my dickens on with an orphan story. So I was, I was thinking about trying to do something with this idea of orphans. Um, also, our personal circumstances circumstances are such that it's not immediately obvious who would take our children, or this kind of very modern phenomenon. I'm sure many people in this room live far from their families, maybe around the globe or across the country. Um, and I was interested um, in that idea of being a kind of uh, adult orphan far from the family and community that usually is required to raise a kid. Um, so, you know, we had wanted to be kids, and we were trying to pick guardians for our kids. We wanted to be parents. We were trying to pick guardians for our kids. Um, and then I started thinking, you know, what if you didn't have kids because you couldn't have them or you didn't want them or our circumstances just didn't prevail, you didn't have them, um, but then you suddenly inherited my kids <laughs> or any kids. And what would that look like uh, if parenthood uh, lands on you uninvited? Um, so that kind of became the premise for this story that this couple who had been trying to have children but there was a sort of unacknowledged strain of ambivalence about that decision. What would happen if they suddenly became parents to this kid? And how would that change them? So that's really the premise and how I, how I got there. Um, and I was interested also in writing from the perspective of a man, which I hadn't done a lot. Um, so I, this character who kind of took over is this guy James. He's a sort of unlikely aging hipster. Uh, recently fired, he's on the edge of a midlife crisis, um, and he discovers to his surprise that fatherhood is his calling. Um, meanwhile, his wife, who's a corporate lawyer and quite successful, and has sort of been making the motions toward motherhood, maybe, maybe decides it's not for her, and is it still a taboo? Can a woman still say, I don't, can a woman say in this day and age, I don't think I want to be a mother? Is that a scandalous thing to say? So, those are some of the things that I was investigating. Um, there was a lot of drama in it and a lot of comedy, um, and it opened up a wealth of social issues about parenting and consumption. Um, but mostly I just wanted to write something really beautiful and true. I tried. <laughs> so I'm going to just read the opening chapter of this, and then maybe we can talk. I hope people will want to. Um, and in this opening chapter, James, the aging hipster to which I referred, um, gets the call that something has happened to their friends. The Tuesday after Labor Day. 
In the end, it took Anna and James only an hour to become parents. James arrived first, stumbling toward a police officer, sitting on a chair by a door marked morgue. He felt his eyes ballooning, growing too big for his face. He tried, but could not blink. You are awake, he thought. This is happening. My name is James Richmore, he said to the policeman, who stood up quickly, as if caught in the act. James noticed he was short, or shorter than James. My name is James Richmore. Just a moment, and the policeman went into the room, leaving James in an empty hallway, sniffing at alcohol and something he couldn't identify. Fire, burning hair, it was freezing down here, devoid of heat. The second finger on his left hand turned white at the tip. The policeman reappeared, holding open the door. When James entered, the contents of the room dropped away. All that was left was a body covered with a sheet, hovering in bottomless space. But in fact, the tray jutted out of the wall, a matchbox sleeve. James could not tell if the thing upon it was male or female. Other people were there. He would remember that. The chatter in the grocery store dullness of all crowds, uttering words from television shows about foreigners and death reports. No voices were lowered. A woman pulled back the sheet. She wore clear rubber gloves that left her wedding band visible. James looked down and recognized Marcus. The checkmark scar beneath his bottom lip. His black hair was matted with tar. Why would that be? Why tar on his face? Who closed his eyes? James ran rapid fire through questions, but silently, his mouth too dry to speak. Why does he look so different? Can it be only the difference between the living and the dead? Then he realized that the difference, the strangeness, came down to something simple. Marcus was almost always smiling. James had never seen his lips so straight. There was no peace about him, no angel repose, no release, no calm. He looked agitated, unsettled, as if he'd just been annoyed by a telemarketer. Yes, it's him, said James, though no one had asked a question. His legs felt hollow, swirling with smoke but he did not feel ill. He was not repulsed or disgusted. He did not find it hard to look upon the body. Then the tray slid back into its cabinet and was sealed with a heavy handle. The woman in the rubber gloves smiled at him. Well worn, this smile, thought James. On his way upstairs in the elevator, she stayed with him. She had removed her gloves, stared straight ahead. She was tiny. Everyone seemed small that day. You have a strange job, James told her. She pecked a nod. You're so little, how do you lift the bodies? Is it hard? Then there was a roaring in his ears, the sound of steel twisting a train exploding off its rails. He leaned against the wall and closed his eyes, heard a stream of sound pour forth from the tiny woman's mouth, but he was unable to distinguish one word from the next. The elevator stopped, and the woman put her hand under his elbow. She guided him out on his empty legs, past green walls, his feet on different colored footprints stenciled on the floor. She appeared to be following the line of purple footprints, and so James did too, pulled along as if riding a skateboard, past elevators, around corners. At first, there were a few patients walking here and there, someone with his papery ass hanging out in the open air, pushing an IV. But as the other colored footprints disappeared, the corridors grew quieter, more deserted. Though he knew it already, James was reminded that what was coming next was serious. Not as serious as the basement, as Marcus frozen in a drawer, but serious. At room 5117, they stopped before a closed door. The woman propped James up against the wall and entered the room alone, a bellhop doing one last pass before opening the door to a guest. When the door opened for him at last, James saw a body on the bed. It was cleaner than Marcus, its face bloated, the head held to the body by a large collar. Tubes snaked from the fingers and white bandages soaked with deep brown circles covered the head. A plastic hose hung from the open mouth like something being expelled. Her eyes were closed, but the sound of the machines clapping and whirring was like a language, the body announcing itself to this room, singing its name, Sarah. This room. James glanced around at all the people who emerged then slowly, in full relief. Unfamiliar faces, and in the middle, a male nurse cradling a bundle of sheets in his arms. 
Out of the sheets, dangling in the air, was a foot encased in a small white running shoe. James moved then fast toward the sheets, which were not sheets at all, but a boy. And not a boy, but Finn, Marcus and Sarah's Finn. It was the longest walk James had ever taken, those six steps through a room of strangers, his arms out, his body trembling. Give him to me, he whispered. Angry at the time between the now and the boy he needed to put to his chest. Angry that no one had given him over sooner. He grabbed the bundle, and my God, it was still warm, which meant he was alive, didn't it? And then something happened that was not of this earth, that was transporting, undenied. The bundle shook to life. Let loose a howl never heard before, a howl from a place in the boy of all knowing, of the minds beneath the beneath, a sound of despair that rolled like a boulder over James. He held the boy closer, the boy who would soon be too big for this kind of holding, his legs dangling from James's torso, a sneaker on one foot, a dirty sock on the other as if he had been running. The sticky black tar was not tar, James recognized finally, but blood. Blood in Finn's blonde hair that James was weeping into, keening along with him but holding on, holding him, the unbreakable, undroppable boy. Okay, that's it. it there are funny parts, I swear, but you have to buy it. That's what's going to have to happen if you want to be used. So, okay, well, I think I'm probably just going to stop reading and see if anyone has anything that they want to talk about. Yes? Uh, my name is Ron. I actually Hi. read one of your uh, articles today. It's called, Why Are We So Scared of Eye Contact? Oh, that. yeah, right. Um, I actually, I recall a sentence you're saying, like, that you said, uh, eye contact is vanishing and I even miss it, and I'm constitutionally shy, prone to ducking people by hiding behind players who struggle with kicking a cowardly, scooby doo fashion. Um, judging by what you've done today, like reading and stuff, that opposed to, like, just, I mean, you're obviously very good woman, like, I think mean, most guys would probably be shy of talking to you. But why would you say you're shy? Like, I mean, you were a critic, you display this emotion into, like, people to you, so you've met people, and you, like, are you just, do you do that secret with just, uh, um, that's interesting. Shyness. Um, I guess it's performance, to be honest. It's sort of required. It's actually something we were talking about at lunch when I got into journalism. I mean, I, I think most writers by nature are introverts. And, you know, I would like to be in a cave with headphones on, just writing and not talking to anybody. That's sort of my natural state. <laughs> but you kind of can't, unless you're a very special person, um, well-funded, uh, you have to get out in the world now. Um, and to make a living writing, I realized really soon, like when I was in my 20s and starting in newspapers, that I would also have to appear on TV and radio, um, and I would be making presentations, and I was going to have to be out there. And it's not my natural state at all. Um, but like anything, I think I've learned how to do it in a way that I can bear. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it is a little bit of a contradiction, right? Um, the sort of public performance aspect of being in the media now versus the kind of quiet solitude that's required for, to actually write and think. Um, but I don't mind it now, and especially I am always really happy, actually, with students. I feel really much more comfortable. I hate going to writers' festivals. I've done a few of those, and it's like a nightmare for me. Um, but I also am always really happy to read from my fiction. It's much easier for me to talk about my fiction and to read from it because I really love it. And I have much more ambivalence about journalism as a profession and what I create there. So, I don't know. I'm faking it. There's my short answer. Well, like, a lot of eye contact is really hard like, nowadays, like you said. But it seems like for you it might have been a lot more difficult because you are meeting more famous people like, as it is for normal people just going up and just seeing these people that are starting to you're just being shy about it. But, yeah. Yeah, maybe. You know, it's funny. I never fe uh, felt very starstruck around stars. There, and it's if you look them in the eye, it's just diffused immediately. And I think that so many people don't. That if you're one on one in a room with somebody who's a celebrity and you just address them kindly, because they're usually really fragile and damaged, <laughs> but like with a little bit of humanity and look them in the eye, that 
it's gone. Like that star thing just goes immediately. So that was never that that part of it was never hard for me because it didn't feel like they were real or something. It's much harder for me, like walking into a party by myself. That to me is terrifying. But sitting down with, you know, Naomi Watts is like that's fine. <laughs> I just did that, so that's fresh in my mind. She's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I normally read nonfiction in the globe. Uh, I don't want you to diss your employer or anything, but I'm wondering how you feel about your your articles appearing in the style section near the back with a pink background. Yes, pink background. Um, well, that's actually changed because I'm now, uh, I think my, I just finished my first month in the arts and life section. Um, how do I feel about that? I mean... And now it's Sarah. Yeah, so Hampton is, has that space now. Hampton or Hampson? Hampson. Yeah, sure. That's terrible. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm very aware that there's a ghetto for female writers writing about, you know, social and domestic issues. And it's something that I actually address in this book a little bit, obliquely, and it's something I think about a lot. Um, because I would like to see women writers represented all over journalism in the investigative sections and the hard-hitting news sections, and um, I wish my skills were there. But unfortunately, the thing that I think I'm good at and that I really love is popular culture, which I think gets uh, written off a little bit as girly stuff or um, you know light. Um, so it ends up in sections like style. Um, but I always try to take that space really seriously, despite the pink background and the fact that it's surrounded by articles on how to set your dining room table or, you know, weight loss obsessions or whatever. I always try to do the best with the circumstances that I have as a writer, because you don't really get to pick and choose if you're trying to make a living, right? So I just appreciated having that platform and tried to do something of substance with it. Um, and that's my struggle every single week, is like trying to find something that I think other people will be interested in, that I'm interested in, that I have strong feelings about, that I think is worth the space in the paper. Um, and you don't always hit it, <laughs> but I try. So, you know, I also feel I should defend the style section. Many talented people are working there, and the industry is in such turmoil that they're courting advertisers transparently and you know a lot of what you read looks like advertising and it's a really tough time in journalism so I think there's a lot of good people who are doing their best with really limited resources right now but but now you can read me on Friday and the plain this I guess <laughs> this is what it looks like now no pink very old headshot from like three years ago <laughs> Fridays so tomorrow there'll be something in there yes so would you say you're pro celebrity or do you, like because I'm getting the feeling that you're a negative celebrity? Pro I don't know. I'm not I don't think I feel like I hate celebrities or down with celebrities or anything. I think I'm more interested in why the mass culture is so obsessed with celebrity and what space that is maybe filling for us. You know, what is it that compels us to follow the lives of um, you know broken, semi-talented uh, actors, and act or not even reality TV stars, right? I mean, and I don't feel above this stuff, like I'm as fascinated and willing to be diverted as anybody, but I'm really interested in why, why that's become such an industry, there's so much money going into these things, there's um, so much discourse about it, casually and seriously, and um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not a, like rampaging against one. I'm just interested in kind of unpacking what it is that's at the source of that fascination. And it comes up a lot for me. I mean, I just see it everywhere on television and the film. And so, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, do you suppose that popular culture is more dominated by things like reality TV as opposed to film and television that has been in the past? Writing, things like that? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's an emphasis on the self right now. Uh, it's always been there, but I think, I think that the advent of reality television, which is now over 10 years, right, since the first Survivor, that, I mean, it's taken, if you look at the programming, uh, it's cheap, right? It's really cheap for networks to do this. They're also strapped. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
do-it-yourself entertainment through technology, through YouTube, that kind of thing. Um, you know, it's a way that we can, can communicate with each other fast and freely. Um, but I, I mean, I think a lot of it is terrible. <laughs> I don't think it's. I don't think it's particularly edifying. Um, and I wonder if it crowds out more interesting stories. You know, that would be my kind of major concern with it is like what space is it taking up um, in the world of arts uh, that it's you know five nights a week of these American Idol type shows that all seem exactly the same um, it just becomes kind of white noise and there's not a lot of thinking or creativity involved in it as far as I can tell um, yeah I think there's right I'm not wrong I think there's so much of it now so it's a real infatuation <laughs> I'm sure someone can come up with a very good defense of reality TV. I'd be interested to hear that. Yeah. Um, I just had a question, like with declining like print sales, and you were saying about how like the industry is in turmoil. And I guess like with the rise of the internet and the mm -hmm. sort of volume, where do you see the profession of journalism going? Oh God, it's you guys have to solve this. <laughs> um. I'm not optimistic, I mean, I, I hate to say that. Uh, there are people who, who are optimistic. I think it will be unrecognizable to people like me, who come from the old world um, of conventional print. Um, I think the biggest issue that's unresolved is how to pay people for their work. Because what happened was that you know, mistakes were made a long time ago um, with this idea of free content and this bigger philosophical idea that content needs to be free or should be free all the time, which is an interesting idea in a democracy, but it also means that there are a lot of people, skilled people, who aren't getting paid for their work. Um, and I think it has sort of decimated the quality of writing that's out there where suddenly a blog is, it looks equivalent when you're clicking to the New York Times, but in fact, you know, these people who are trying to be professionals. Not the, and I think there's great work going on out there that is unpaid and is being done in the blogosphere, but, you know, it's very unfettered, it's unchecked. Um, and I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it's a, this is a big week. Like, the Globe just went behind a paywall this week, and they're going to see if people are willing to pay. Um, the New York Times did that a couple of years ago, or I think only about a year and a half ago, and it's actually worked all right for them. Um, so things might be shifting a little bit that way in conventional journalism, but I think it's, I think that that, all of that is going to be over here and there's going to be something really new and maybe really exciting to replace it. Um, and it is going to have to do with different delivery systems. I think things are getting much more visual and away from the printed word and the written word. Um, I don't know if that's, if I should be crying over that or not. I sometimes feel like it just because I see so many really talented people laid off and out of work. Um, and the rates in freelance journalism in magazines in Canada have literally been the same since the 1970s. So it's impossible to just do one thing anymore, which could be exciting, right? We all become hyphenates and we create our own brands and put ourselves out there, but you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very exhausting to do that. <laughs> and sometimes it would be nice to just have a job, but that's becoming very rare in journalism. The staff job is becoming a thing of the past. I don't want to rain on anybody's parade here. I'm sorry. I think that's all I want to be Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Do you feel like you were overly optimistic about your journalism career? Do you think that you had the knowing what you know now and follow the same path? Would I follow the same path knowing what I know now? Um, well, probably. And that's actually a, a, a good reminder for me that you asked that because. I think if you want to write for a living, or if you want to write, it's just a compulsion. And you can't really do anything else. Um, you just have to do it, for better or worse, whether you get paid or not. And uh, I mean, I think I would have done some things differently. And there are definitely days where I sit around with my other writer friends and we go through catalogs for colleges. <laughs> and say like, hey, maybe we'll become mediators or flower arrangers or we'll all go back and get our BA. It's like, there's gotta be something um, else out there. But, but no, I probably, if I was starting today, 
I don't think the thing I do exists. I don't think it would be taught anywhere. Um, I don't know if I would take a journalism degree. My degrees are both in English. I never studied journalism. Um, but I, I would still be writing. I would still have to write. I don't really have a choice. This is the only thing I can do. I, have no, I was a waitress. I was pretty good at that. So it's either waitressing or writing, and I choose writing. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. I thought I saw someone. I'm not even on that side. Yeah. Just personally, do you, have you always been in Toronto? Have you ever lived in Toronto? Um, well, I'm born and raised in Vancouver, and then I lived in Montreal for a while, but I came here for the duration of my career mostly. I lived in New York for a little bit, I lived in Italy a few years ago, but basically Toronto, yeah. And that's a very good place to be um, as a professional. Yeah, um, it really is still the epicenter for media in Canada, and you can. And also the neat thing about being in Toronto is that Americans are kind of curious about <laughs> Like it has a strange cachet with American publications, so when I pitch in the US, they, they think it's kind of interesting. And I think I can get an ear a little more easily than if I were one of the, you know, thousands of faceless writers in New York. So I thought it would actually be a disadvantage to be here, but I've managed to do some writing outside of Canada from here, and it um, hasn't been too much of a problem if you get the contacts. It's always about contracts. So. Yeah. yeah. Sure. When you were younger, did you think about the romance of like, Hemingway coming to work for the Toronto Star mm -hmm. as a journalist and started out that way, and then ultimately you would kind of go away to some island and drop a lot of novels? Right. Um, yeah, I think I was pretty romantic about writing. I still try to be about the fiction, because I think if you don't have that element at play, then it would be really difficult to do it. It's such a passion project, the fiction. Um, I didn't have a lot of models for writing. My parents were both teachers, and um, they loved words, but I, I met one writer when I was growing up, and I was obsessed with her. She was she was a family friend who writes kind of tawdry, sexy novels in London under a, a, an alias, and uh, I couldn't believe that you could make a living. That she, this was her life. She would just get up every day and she had this apartment and looked out and the Thames, and she would write these sexy novels. And to me, that seemed really exciting. But so I, I think maybe I had that image in my head. I think if you can, if you meet one person who writes for a living, then it kind of gives or does whatever you love for a living, and it gives you permission to pursue it in some way. So I'm glad I had that one image of the life of a writer. Yeah. You know, plagiarism. I know you're under a lot of pressure to meet deadlines, and that's uh, I think this is something that's been a lot of buzz about that, especially on CBC, yes. about people who uh, plagiarize even themselves. Yeah, that's right. Really publish something they've written earlier. The journal error. Yeah. Do you feel that pressure? Um. Well, I, I was saying this earlier, like, I don't feel like a natural columnist for exactly that reason, because I think people who are, really have the right personality for columnists, like, I don't think I'll be doing a column for more than a year, because I'm going to lose it if I have to keep sharing it out. But people, there are people, I mean, you meet these people, and they have, they just have so many opinions and so much to say, and they can turn it out three times a week. Um, but even for those people, I think it's really grueling. And what I would really love for my paper to do and is to, to, I would like to be able to say to them sometimes, I don't have an idea this week, see you next week. <laughs> but you can't, you really can't, right? It's, 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 on some level, it's turning the widgets out in the factory, really. Um, and I think that that's actually uh, at the root of a lot of these issues with plagiarism. And it's not to excuse it, and I can abhor it, disdain it, terrified of it, stay away from it, <laughs> but, um, but I think that writers do get really burnt out, and I think um, Joan Allaire, the young uh, New Yorker writer who you're referring to, is 30 and had written like three books and was on the staff of the New Yorker, which is a really grueling pace to begin with, and he was sort of recycling his own stuff, and then in his most recent book he actually fabricated quotes from Bob Dylan, which is insane, I mean the Bob Dylan people know every breath that that guy has ever taken, you're not going to get away with it. But he did this, and I think he must have been out of his head to think that he could get away with that. 
Um, but I think that that expectation of constant productivity is also very much of our time, right? Like you, you, it's very hard to just say, no, I need space. I need, I'm not going to be on Twitter today. I'm not going to be branding myself today. I just need time to think. Um, but carving out that space to think is not lucrative. <laughs> And people don't really want you to do it because the, you know these papers are panicking. They feel that they're getting beaten all the time by the internet, and they are. And they want more, and they want it faster. And I think these are the conditions under which plagiarism happens. Um, that said, it's up to us, the journalists, to absolutely ensure that it doesn't. Um, so yeah, it's it's uh, on the minds of, of everybody right now for sure. Yeah. So how, how old were you when you first published? I mean, when did you first release? Uh, well, I wrote in university. I, I was the arts editor at co-editor um, at uh, my student newspaper at McGill, which was a great place to meet people. A lot of those people who I work with are in media and all kinds of different places now. And uh, so, I mean, that was the first time I was really published. But the first time I was published for money was when I, I moved to Toronto and I spent a few years waitressing and camping and selling articles to little magazines like this magazine, a shift magazine which doesn't exist anymore. And then I was offered an unpaid internship at Toronto Life. And I have a very principled stance about unpaid internships. <laughs> and I also couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. My parents don't live here. I didn't have anywhere else. I needed to make money and I couldn't figure out how I was supposed to work 40 hours a week for no money. Um, and I turned it down. And then I applied for an internship at Canadian Business Magazine, which paid $1,500 a month. And that was enough, which is t nothing for their budget. <laughs> but it was enough for me in my 20s to live on. And that was probably the first really public, that was the first paid thing that I did. And I ended up getting a couple of cover stories out of that internship at Canadian Business. And then I was kind of connected to, at the time, what was McLean Hunter and Shadowly and all these other publications. And I was, I guess, 25 when I did that internship. I'd done a lot before. Like, I didn't go right from, I traveled a lot and did other things in between. So in the mid to late 20s. You have two kids? Two kids, yes, seven and eight. Yeah, tiring. <laughs> your, your husband teaches at college. He teaches, well, my husband teaches uh, at Upper Canada College, which is like a boys' school, a private school. He teaches English. Yeah. That helps. So there's that edge about. Not well, this is the thing. I mean, it's a real trade-off, and we talk about this. That he has a straight job, and I, he doesn't always love being that person <laughs> with the with the normal job. But one of us has to, so that I can do what I do. Um, and uh, that might switch eventually, because he's a really talented writer, and he will need some space to do that. And I'll probably have to get a regular job. Um, but for now, <laughs> he's carrying that burden, and he's a very good teacher. So, yeah. Do you feel the pressure to be on Twitter every day? I really oh, I have such mixed feelings about Twitter. Some ways I like it because it's so fast and furious that you don't have to spend too much, you have to think, it's not like blogging, we have to think that hard. But I, I also feel like all of this stuff just eats up time that should be spent writing. Um, but I had to get, I mean, I was told flat out, like, you have to be on Twitter, you have to be on Facebook. It's like, hey, I hate Facebook. I have the most minimal presence on Facebook. Prefer Twitter to Facebook, but no, I don't go on every day because there are days where I just can't bear it, and then there are days where I see stuff and I feel excited about it and I do want to tweet. But I, I, I don't know. I don't know how people do it. My friend, I have a friend who's at the New York Times, he's an editor of the New York Times magazine. He's on there every 20 minutes. Like I don't know. I don't know. People are have incredible constitutions. <laughs> well, I'm going to Thank you very much. Here we have a few copies of each of the novels, and I hope that some of you do come down and buy because Trina will be happy to sign for you. Thanks again for being here, and we'll see you on 22nd of November for Jeff Lemire, the comic book graphic novelist. See you then. <laughs>